Hello, everyone. We're glad you're with us. I'm Lori Ward. I'm CEO at Washington's National Park Fund. And after 10 years, I continue to believe that I absolutely have the best job in the world. It's such a, a privilege and joy to serve as ambassadors for Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Uh, we're excited because there's some, some new change in our three national parks. And one of those new changes is Greg Dudgeon, who's with us here today. Um, in the past, when new superintendents would come on, I, I kind of stayed back for a while, giving them a lot of space because they certainly have their hands full as they start to get their feet underneath them. But, um, you know, Greg was in touch within a couple of weeks when he got here and very excited to start teaming up with us and excited and, and grateful for what we, and I mean a number of you who are donors, we uh, have created and, and um, raised over the years for Mount Rainier. And, uh, you know, you've also heard me say um, the best is yet to come and it truly is. We'll be launching some new um, ventures this upcoming year. So stay close. Uh, with that, we continue to have great success with our virtual field trips. People are very happy that, that we have them. A great opportunity to get educated and uh, to fee see and, and hear stories directly from the park. So uh, we're glad we launched them when we did and just continue to have a lot of fun with them. Washington's National Park Fund is headed up by a great board. A number of folks are with us today. Uh, of 21 individuals, very engaged, very, very hard workers and very committed to all that we do with and for the parks. We have a great strong staff and a lot of uh, friends who are with us today and maybe our friends from Ireland are with us. I'll see here once we get started. With that, I want to introduce Greg Dudgeon formally. Uh, Greg has been at Rainier since mid-July He's a 30 year veteran with the National Park Service. He got his start um, at Glacier Bay National Park. He actually met Randy King there when Randy was working there. And um, Greg went on to work a number of places and we'll see some images today, but Bering Land Bridge National Preserve in Nome. Uh, if you haven't been there, be sure and look it up. It's just stunning. Everything up there is stunning. Um, he became ranger or chief ranger there. He went on and eventually became superintendent of a number of the um, public lands up in Alaska. Um, he has extensive experience with historical, caring for historical preservation and cultural resources. Um, he's managed them in balance with natural resource conservation for public use. Excuse me. He enjoys collaborating. Clearly, he enjoys collaborating with partners like Washington's National Park Fund. We already are hitting the ground running, and I'm excited about that. We're fortunate to have you with us here, to here today, Greg, and really fortunate to have you heading up the great people at Mount Rainier National Park. You have an outstanding staff, and I know that you already know that. So, um, Greg, you've been a very lucky guy. You have uh, worked in several of the, I think, the most beautiful national parks in the world. Um, and for the next 15 minutes, we're gonna walk through some of the photos that, that you shared with us. And it was very difficult to select the, the finalists, but, and have you share a few stories about the places that we see on the screen, the places and the characters, one in particular. Um, you know, when I think about Northern Lights and Casey, go ahead, let's dive right in. Here in Washington State, Greg, as you know, you and I have talked about it, we scramble to see the Northern Lights. You know, when they're predicted, we're all trying to find the dark skies and the different places. And um, tell us a little bit about this photo, about your experience with Northern, Northern Lights up in Alaska. Thank you for joining us, my friend. Well, hey, thank you, Lori. This is, a, this is a real pleasure. I've been looking forward to this opportunity to in, my, introduce myself and, and, and to do it. Uh, this way with uh, people literally from uh, around the state and country. Um, uh, what a pleasure, what a privilege, thanks. Uh, I am Greg Dudgeon, uh, the recently arrived new superintendent, that's Mount Rainier. 
Uh, I walked into the office uh, in uniform for the first time on the 23rd of July, and it's just been a, a fantastic uh, uh, experience since. Um, it's been busy, uh, a bit of a wind tunnel. Uh, what a time to arrive at a national park like Mount Rainier in the, in the, uh, the, the, the middle of summer, but uh, also uh, uh, it's a good way uh, to uh, to start learning on your feet quickly. And I've had plenty of opportunities for that. Um, so to your question, you're right. I, uh, I had uh, almost 30 years of experience working for the National Park Service uh, in a number of management areas in Alaska. And this particular photo that I shared with you is from Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve, one of the, one of the two areas I was superintendent of just prior to coming here to Mount Rainier. And uh, for those of you who don't know Yukon Charlie, uh, the, the preserve is roughly the size of Yellowstone. Uh, it's uh, comprised of the first 120 miles or so of the Yukon River as it flows from Canada into Alaska. And uh, from the gateway community of Eagle, which is a, a village of about 120 people, you float 100 miles down the Yukon and you come to uh, this area that uh, is uh, called uh, Coal Creek. And at Coal Creek, which is an old historic mining district, which is now within the preserve and owned by the National Park Service, is an old two-story roadhouse. And this is Slavin's Roadhouse, which has been uh, well taken care of by the National Park Service, rebuilt uh, to its original form uh, uh, a few years ago. And uh, people use it throughout the year, summer, uh, fall, winter, uh, even, and spring. And uh, this is a, a, an image of, of a, a relatively typical night on a clear night there with the northern lights overhead and a very timeless setting indeed. It's beautiful. Ah. And you saw the Northern Lights quite often, didn't you? You got to experience them. Well, Fair, Fairbanks, of course, is, is uh, well known for the Northern Lights. And whether you're in your front yard uh, or the further away you get from any sort of artificial light and a clear night, particularly when the, uh, the lights are active, um, which uh, is often frequently, uh, it's not a rare thing at all. As a matter of fact, the other park that I was managing prior to arriving here, Gates of the Arctic National Park and Preserve, our gateway community of Bettles, which has a year-round population of 12, wow. um, is one of the places people from around the world uh, go to to be able to see the Northern Lights. Uh, one, it's geographically in a great location, there, and, and two, there are no artificial light sources to get in the way. And of course, you're above the tree line there. So uh, it's uh, horizon to horizon northern lights. At wow. Time. wow. Wow. That's just so great. Thank you, Casey. Next, Greg, we hear that the um, Yukon gold potatoes, which are my husband's favorite, named uh -huh. after the beautiful uh, fall colors surrounding the Yukon um, right at this time, I'm sure. Uh, what do you think? Is that fitting? Do you can you what can you tell us and tell us? I, a bit I, about will, I, I will let you tell me about the potatoes and, and whether <laughs> they fit or not. I, I uh, they're a favorite of mine too. But uh, one of the aspects of Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve is there's a wild and scenic river within that preserve, which from its headwaters to where it uh, uh, enters into the Yukon River, the entire length of the river. Um, the Charlie River is within the bright line boundaries of this National Park Service management unit. And as far as I know, that's the only case uh, in the entire National Park Service system where from headwaters to where the river exits uh, within the confines of a, of a, a, man, a, a National Park Service managed unit. And uh, this is the Charlie, and this is the very typical color that you will see in that part of Alaska, uh, in that national park area this time of year. What are those? What is, is what are they? Tamarack? Oh, they're are they cottonwood. Lichen? What? It's, what? it's cotton, cottonwood. These are trees. Cottonwood. Cottonwood. Wow, that is so beautiful, Greg. Uh -huh. Thank you. 
Next slide, case. Tell us about this colorful character. What well, a great have, photo. Uh, there, That's amazing. You know, uh, Alaska has plenty of characters, but you're actually looking at uh, dog mushing royalty here. This is Ali Zirkel, who has won the 1,000 mile long Yukon Quest, uh, uh, and as well as uh, traditionally a very strong contender in the Iditarod. And uh, Ali, uh, again, and her husband, Alan Moore, just retired this past year. Uh, as a matter of fact, they offered us one of their retired sled dogs. Uh, you had oh. a photo of Luca earlier uh, mm -hmm. to bring with us. And uh, that was probably just a little more than uh, we, having two already that we were ready to, to take on. But uh, Allie and her husband um, um, are competitive mushers or were until this past year, competitive mushers. And uh, I included this photo and those that I, I, I shared with you just to give a sense of, again, that uh, even though Alaska is wild and rugged, Yukon Charlie has, again, roughly the size of Yellowstone, but no maintained trails uh, 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 or roads. Uh, um, you travel, it's, it's, uh, uh, you travel uh, by boat or by snow machine or dog team, skis, uh, uh, wherever you wish, and, um, and, and have the ability and the skill sets to get to. And uh, this is just one of the ways that people enjoy and recreate in the park service lands in Alaska. That's great, thank you. And uh, tell us about these two little beauties, Luke All right. and so our, our, Of course, our two dogs. Uh, as, as many of you may know, the uh, Denali National Park and Preserve uh, maintains a working sled dog kennel. And they are actually celebrating their 100th anniversary year of running sled dogs, working sled dogs in the park. And a primary reason purpose for that is much of Denali, like many of the parklands in Alaska, are designated wilderness where motorized vehicles uh, uh, are not allowed. And also the opportunity to practice traditional life skills is an important aspect of how we do the work uh, as well as recreate up there. And so Denali maintains a, a, a working sled dog kennel of 30 to 40 animals. And when the, uh, when the dogs reach the age of nine, they're retired. And uh, so we um, ended up adopting Solace, the, the dog that you see to the right, who was retired early. And uh, you'll probably notice from the photograph, she, she only has three legs. Um, there was oh. a, a, a sad story there. Um, uh, Long story short, she had to have a, a leg removed. Uh, she was uh, 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 was at our house. We had had her for a little less than a year. Uh, she was scared by some um, fireworks that went off on New Year's Day night. And uh, it's a wonderful story that my wife and I hope to capture by book someday. Mm. Uh, she was missing for almost a week. We had well over 1,500 people via social media looking for her. It turned out she had been caught in a trapper's oh. trap mm -hmm. and uh, was let go at some point, but not, uh, not taken to a, a, a oh. vet. And so when we got her back uh, with the help of, of people, again, who were tracking, trying to find her via uh, using social media, mm -hmm. uh, that leg that had been in the trap had frozen and unfortunately uh, had to be removed. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, she's doing wonderfully, is healthy and fit. And the dog next to her is actually, and I should say one more thing. Uh, uh, for those of you who, who, who follow, uh, Denali has a puppy cam. And every year awesome. when their sled dog kennels uh, uh, have their puppies, they have an online camera. You can watch these puppies grow and develop and be trained. Solace was born in 2015. She was part of the Find Your Park litter that year. People from around the world watched her and her siblings grow up. And uh, as when she was missing, we were hearing from people from Iceland and from Russia and from Czechoslovakia who were asking if she had been found. This was a dog that they had had uh, watched grow up or had visited when they went to Denali. Um, and uh, her the dog next to her, uh, is her father, Lukor. And uh, Lukor was uh, born in 2010 at Denali. Uh, he was part of the uh, Bumblebee pack. The, the park decided 
uh, that year to uh, to um, capture the concern about bumblebees and 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 the fact they were disappearing, uh, and for reasons we didn't all understand or know at that time. His full name is Bombus leucorum. He was named for a particular species of bumblebee, the white-tailed bumblebee. And uh, Lucre was the primary lead dog for Denali for many years. As a matter of fact, when he was retired and we adopted him, he had over 10,300 miles of work in the backcountry in Denali, pulling sleds and freight along with other dogs. The two of them are doing great here. Uh, they right. love Mount Rainier. and. Uh, Anytime they see a ranger or somebody in uniform, they, of course, that's been their entire life. And uh, they're just retired rangers. Uh, that's a great story. Um, I love that. I love that all the way around. Thank you for that. I was just going to mention over at Olympic, they have um, a BARC program where they, they teach owners how to um, recreate responsibly when their pets are in places that allow dogs and that is a program that Washington's National Park Fund has had the privilege of supporting. So that's pretty sweet. Uh, this is a great shot. Explain, tell us what, well, yeah. So, so one of the few roaded parks in Alaska is of course Denali. We've been talking about Denali and this was, uh, I'm not even sure where this one originated from. I've had this photo on hand for a while, but you can see uh, Denali, the former Mount McKinley in the background. And uh, you can see uh, a brown bear sow and her two cubs um, uh, uh, looking for uh, food in the early season, the spring along the road here. And, you know, I, I, I think about this um, not only in terms of the wildlife and, and just the, 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 the amazing opportunities that national parks provide people to connect with these places uh, in, in, a, in a, almost an emotional as well as an intellectual way. But of course, you're looking in the, the, the mirror here of a vehicle that was on the road. And it's just a reminder that as important as that looking ahead and, and, and the windshield is in our lives, we can't forget to look behind us either. And uh, it's both a, a, a tangible reminder of that, uh, of that uh, uh, look ahead, but don't forget behind, uh, but also to, again, just the magic uh, 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 these places and what it is that they protect and provide for us and, and future generations to come. Uh, it's a, it's, I know you introduced this session today as having one of the best jobs ever. And, you know, I, I would arm wrestle you over that. I think our mission of protecting and sharing these places, uh, which is the Park Service mission uh, distilled, uh, is really uh, the greatest job in the world. Uh, that is an incredible mountain. I, I have not been fortunate enough to see it. It was cloudy when I was there, but wow, that is so beautiful. Thank you, Greg. Well, so um, we had a little clip here. It, it wonder it asked you about, do you get frequent flyer miles on float planes because you've been in so many, but all kidding aside, tell us about this photo that we're seeing and um, a bit about, did, did you ever in your early days get air sickness? I know my husband worked at Mountain Village and the up and down when you're going out. Um, yeah, tell us stories about this. Well, again, when you're working in roadless parks and mo <laughs> many of the, the Alaska parks are roadless, um, uh, airplanes um, and particularly uh, float planes uh, are sort of our, our, our pickup trucks. It's uh, how you get to work, it's how you carry supplies, uh, it's how you uh, accomplish the mission. And uh, I just included this photo in those that I sent to you because it, it, it captures not only the season, but the essence of Alaska. The fact that uh, uh, these places uh, are great to a great extent undisturbed and uh, the unconfined recreation that, uh, that they provide in addition to the inspiration that, uh, that they offer. Um, in terms of flying, uh, Gosh, been doing it uh, almost since the, the very beginning. And uh, it's the primary way to get to work. And a number of our staff in Alaska couldn't do their jobs without the uh, opportunity that uh, and the access that aircraft provide. That's a beautiful shot. It's really beautiful. Thank you, Greg. This one, my goodness. What can I say? That is just so amazing. 
So one of the, the great opportunities and privileges I had was working um, in uh, Kotzebue, Alaska. And uh, one of the four national park areas that we managed from Kotzebue was Kobuk Valley National Park. This is a very special place for a variety of reasons. Uh, number one, when I was there in the early uh, 2000s, late 1990s and early 2000s, the Western Arctic caribou herd numbered about a half a million animals. And uh, if you can imagine, um, twice a year as they are migrating from their winter range to uh, the northern ranges where they spend the summer and, 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 and give birth, they're crossing the Kobuk River and many of them will cross the Kobuk at or near this spot. Um, today it's called Onion Portage. It's um, a long ways from anywhere, but what you should know about it is, is not only do caribou cross the Kobuk in great numbers there today going north and, and south, but um, they've been doing so for at least 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. For a while, it was this location that uh, the oldest uh, known inhabitants or use of um, an area by, by mankind had been documented by archeologists. Mm -hmm. And for literally uh, 10,000 years, probably even more, mm -hmm. uh, people have utilized this area to harvest caribou as they cross the Kobuk River uh, for sustenance. Mm -hmm. And um, today this is part of Kobuk Valley National Park, and it is still a critical place um, for local peoples in Northwest Alaska to go and harvest their, their protein needs um, uh, during the, the, the brief migratory uh, season as caribou are crossing. One more thing I should add, um, it's, almost, it's also a reminder of, of the important lessons and, and, and reminders again of, of climate change. Whereas the herds used to, when I was there, not all that long ago, late 1990s and early 2000s, you could almost count on the caribou starting to arrive and cross the river around Labor Day weekend. In more recent years, that's become less and less so. And in some years, the caribou don't cross in large numbers anymore at all. And it's uh, thought that this has much to do with the changing seasons and the way in which climate change is um, impacting not only how animals uh, uh, conduct their, their lives, but also the uh, plant life and uh, the larger ecosystems as well. That's amazing. Um, our neighbors right here in our building, we're downtown Seattle. Uh, Tom and Sonia Campion are huge uh, champions, the Campion champions of preservation of the national, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge up there. And um, so, yeah, just thank you. <laughs> thank you. Next slide. Thanks. This just, I, I am, I am always and as a child I used to draw mountains like this and put snow on the top and I, all my life literally I've been inspired by peaky peaks this one hello it's like so incredible so you're you, what, what you and the participants here are looking at is Mount Sukapak and you didn't know it but by mentioning uh, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and your friend who uh, uh, has a great passion for that place, you'll need to share this image with them. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a mountain that lies between Gates of the Arctic to the west and Arctic National Wildlife Refuge to the east. Uh, this is Mount Sukapak, which is just uh, a little ways up from one of our ranger stations and residences for Gates of the Arctic. And uh, for those who are fortunate enough to have been along the, uh, the Dalton Highway or the Hall Road, uh, this is probably one of the mm -hmm. more notable, <clears throat> excuse me, um, mountains that you will see. And it just reminds me so much of the country there and what's at stake, again, as we think about not only now, but future generations and the opportunities that hopefully what we're doing can help collectively 
what we are doing can help provide for the same sorts of opportunities for recreation, for inspiration and recreation that these landscapes provide. Oh, geez, that's really beautiful. Thank you, Greg. We're gonna bring you back home, back to your new home. That's right. And um, that was a great, for me, it was just a great journey. I hope everyone enjoyed it. It inspires me to get up there. And um, so thank you for that. Uh, you arrived in the park, like you said, in, in mid-July, you know, kind of the park slow season. So that was nice for you, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> what struck you most when you traveled up to Paradise and, and Sunrise? You know, what were some of the things that you just, what struck you most, Greg? Two, two things immediately. The first is on my first flight to Alaska back in 1983, when I was going up to, to, to work in Glacier Bay, not for the park service, but for the, the concessioner and, and, and to volunteer for the park. Um, I will never forget seeing Mount Rainier out the right side of that Alaska Airlines jet and just, it captured, that, that view captured my imagination. And I'm sure anybody who has had a flight on a clear day knows what I'm talking about. So arriving on the 23rd of, or, or the 22nd of July and, and going, to, going to work the first day on the 23rd of July, it was just that following Monday that I headed up to Paradise. And to see that mountain that, uh, again, having first seen in, in 1983, but from this side and that close, um, I was just struck by that. And it was just one of those moments that hopefully we all have in life on more than just occasions mm -hmm. where um, it's just, you understand and know that there's something greater uh, than, um, just the day to day. It, it's 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 an intangible, tangible. Uh, but uh, seeing the mountain from the backside, or the, you know, from from paradise, having seen it from the west side from the plane, uh, it was just a full circle for me. And then um, the other thing, you've looked at some images from again almost thirty years in Alaska. There were more people at paradise than I had seen in all my time in Yukon Charlie. And I was struck by that. And it also was, was struck by the challenge and the opportunity that provides us we're at, with here at the park. And that is to ensure that we're continuing to protect the resource while uh, sharing it with the people, the owners of that resource, but in a manner and a means that they wanna to continue to come back and bring their kids and their kids too, because that experience um, is everything that they remember. I love that. I love the hearing you say the challenges and the opportunities because there certainly are both. And um, we're glad you're at the helm there to, to be a part of everything that's going on. We've been amazed and uh, we've enjoyed the years that we have had with a number of wonderful staff members up at Mount Rainier. You know, tell us a little bit about, you've shared a little bit with me and I'm like, I'm all in. Tell us a little bit about the incredible staff up there. I, I am I am just so struck by the group here. Um, for, first, you should know that um, we have a gentleman who has been on staff still, who has been working here since the 1960s. We have, we have uh, dual career couples, uh, wives and husbands, who have been here for many multiple years as well. And I have met staff that um, both uh, recently arrived and, and long-term, but you couldn't tell, wouldn't be able to tell from the energy level or passion. Uh, this is an extremely passionate, uh, devoted group to this park. And uh, I'm struck by both the professionalism, but also the emotional connections that the staff have with this place. Uh, it's just a delight to be a part of the team. I'm sure um, Jim Z is one of our, you know, good friends and he's the head of trails up there and his story about getting started at Mount Rainier. And now today, I think he's, uh, I don't know how many years, but in the thirties that he has been there 30 plus he, years. And um, he's amazing. He's so still I, I, my, one, of, one of my goals here is, as I've shared with the staff is to spend one day or part of one day each week in the park, in the field, not in the office, not in front of a computer, but uh, working with, shadowing, being a part of the, 
the staff, the frontline staff. So Jim and I were actually in the park together on Friday of last week. And we learned that uh, we both started in 1983 and uh, we both started in June. He here on the English Bay. So we, uh, we kind of had a, have a connection that way. That's amazing. Not geographically so much, but, but, but mission. Right. That's right. fun. That's a nice connection for the two of you to kind of put into perspective. Tell us, um, you know, what are some of the most pressing issues facing Mount Rainier today? Well, I think I touched on, on, on the first, and that really has to do with um, uh, the number of people and making sure that we can provide uh, safe, uh, and uh, inspiring opportunities and connections to the park uh, uh, in light of uh, the uh, access that people have from mm -hmm. the cities and the, uh, the areas. Uh, I've, I've learned that people say here when the mountain's out, the cities come here and or the people from the cities come here and, and uh, you know, uh, we love that. The people own this park and it's about protecting and sharing it. But to do so in a way, again, that, that provides for the kind of experiences that people want and need, uh, that's not a small task. Uh, and then, of course, climate change is a huge issue for all of us. And again, that's challenge and opportunity here both. Uh, challenges in terms of how we do our job day to day, uh, but also opportunities in, in terms of helping people understand what's at stake and what we can do about it. Boy. Thank you, Greg. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit for a few minutes and then folks do enter your questions in the chat box or the Q&A box down below and Casey will get back to those. Otherwise, we'll pull them up here in a few minutes and pose them to Greg. So thank you. Uh, let's see. We have had the privilege of being very supportive with a lot of folks who are with us today. Thanks to them of many projects at Mount Rainier. And, you know, the first time you and I talked, you said, oh, Lori, you know, I've heard so much about Washington's National Park Fund. Tell us about a few stories that you've heard about from the staff perspective about the impact donors well, are having on the park. We, we would need a whole nother session <laughs> uh, just, just to, to touch on the things that have been shared with me and that I have seen with my own eyes. Um, uh, Let's we'll start with the volunteer program. The fact that just the, the month that I arrived here, uh, July, uh, we had over 215 um, uh, meadow rovers, people that help us up at Paradise to make sure people are staying on the trails, not, not damaging the, 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 uh, the meadows. Uh, over 1,500 hours and over uh, 37,000 contacts and it's the fun that helps make that possible with our meadow rangers, our, our meadow rovers rather. And then also the Ravens program, if you're not familiar with that, or if there's some who are not familiar with that, um, the fund helps support a volunteer program where we have people in vehicles out on the road system, uh, lending assistance to folks who are in trouble. They've run out of gas, they have a flat tire, uh, maybe they've slipped off the road. Um, uh, or maybe they just have a question about where they can, what they should go see, do, or where they can work, where they can take their dog for a stretch. And, and um, uh, so the, the Raven program, um, wildlife, the Fisher into reintroduction to the park was supported by the fund. We have fishers in the park now. Uh, you and the supporters of the fund help make that possible. Uh, same with um, fisheries management that we do here. Um, I could go on and on. The uh, a first responder and search and rescue equipment mm -hmm. that we have here. This is, of course, a, a, a high alpine, high risk park. Mm -hmm. And so the fund helps provide the support and the materials, uh, the supplies and equipment that we need to be able to help keep people safe in their, their park. Um, I can think of the, uh, the new gate that's been uh, graciously uh, donated and okay. what that will mean in terms of um, uh, better uh, visual markings, uh, uh, better understandable signage. Mm -hmm. um, 
Gloria, like I said, I could go on and on. I think um, I think probably one of the, 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 the most relevant at the moment is how helpful the fund has been uh, given uh, this pandemic and the signage and the uh, outdoor uh, uh, interactions we've been able to do and accommodate here because the fund is, has has made that possible for us in terms of signage, uh, in terms of materials, in terms of exterior stations mm -hmm. where our staff can interact with visitors. Uh, the funds made that made that possible. So um, those are starting points, mm -hmm. and uh, we could have a much mm -hmm. larger conversation. But I want to mm -hmm. thank you. I want to thank your staff, and I want to thank, in particular, the people who are part of mm -hmm. this partnership, this collaboration. Mm -hmm. Uh, that makes the protection, the sharing, and the educating of people who come here um, possible. Well, thank you. And I would guess that the vast majority of the folks who are with us today are, I know they're, I'm seeing so many familiar faces and they deserve to hear that because uh, they've been a part of all of it along the way. So, so thank me, you. Greg. Let yeah. me add then the, the, the sure. one other really critical piece. Yeah. And of course, most people have heard about the Great American Outdoor yeah. Act. And the fact that we have fund um, uh, Washington National Park fund funding that we can help leverage and, and, and make a part of um, enhancements and improvements to places like Paradise makes that uh, those proposals uh, mm -hmm. uh, all the more realistic and viable for the decision makers who are trying to decide how best to put that funding. So, uh, you know, not only are we, we we seeing great benefit from what you all are doing now, but uh, uh, have our fingers crossed and doing our very best in terms of planning for the future. Uh, again, because of what that fund and uh, what the fund and, and the leveraging of uh, of those uh, those partnership donations mean. And fun, isn't it, Greg? Oh. What a blast. <laughs> um, as we begin to wrap up, uh, I just want to thank you. I want to check the, the question and answer box. As we step into the Q&A part, I want to mention that um, it's fun for me to learn this morning that uh, everyone has heard now or will hear right now that Don Stryker is coming down yep. from Denali and he will be serving as superintendent up at North Cascades National Park. And right. it was fun to learn this morning that you and he have worked closely together and know each other. Um, it sounds like the collaboration between the two of you, along with Sarah Krishbaum over at Olympic National Park, it's going to be a lot of fun. So we're looking forward to that, Greg. Yeah, I, it'll be fun to welcome Don here. And yeah. he, he will be a terrific addition to, uh, to the Park Service and the fund collaboration and team. This is a great question. Um, I'm not sure how much of a grasp you'll have on this yet, Don, but, or Greg, excuse me, have the park biologists noticed a distinct change in animal behavior due to the increase in visitors and trail usage over the last few years? Hmm. Have you heard stories about that? That, um, yeah, so that is something a little outside of my knowledge base at the, the moment, okay. it would not yeah. be surprising that additional numbers of people um, would, would could make a difference in terms of animal behavior. Uh, it'd be, it'll be interesting to learn more about species and, and what that change in, in, in behavior uh, uh, is comprised of. Uh, do Alaska parks maintain a fleet of float planes? So each park uh, owns its own airplanes and then the aircraft um, are, are overseen in part by the Office of Aircraft Services, which is mm -hmm. a, another uh, uh, branch, if you will, under the Department of Interior. And they provide sort of the professional aviation expertise and oversight to make sure that, that the planes and the pilots and the equipment are uh, uh, all top notch uh, for you know for for safety purposes and also to make sure that the taxpayers are getting their their um, 
uh, their, their funds are being spent um, safely and wisely. Thank you. Uh, let's see, do you anticipate restricting access to paradise in view of the crowds? You know, what, 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 do, what can you say about that? So we're in the, the middle of, um, or maybe starting to head towards the finalization of a visitor use management uh, uh, plan that has been in process for a bit and is to come to conclusion in a, about a year, a little over a year from now. And that process, which has been very public and there's been a lot of uh, civic engagement, uh, is essentially all about trying to look at what are the potential or what are the best practices that we could potentially put to use here that could again help to mitigate some of the concerns and some of the impacts that come from the type of use and the, and, and the amount of use that we're, we're seeing. The earlier question about wildlife, for example, but also having to do with um, the experience that people are having. Um, hopefully that process, we will all be smarter uh, about what, again, the opportunities and, 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 and what are the parameters that, that, that people are willing to work and stay within in order to protect Rainier and, and make those kinds of experiences um, possible today and into the future. Thank you. Any thoughts of working with the six local tribes for whom Mount Rainier is a traditional land? That is Mount just so, yeah. so critical. Um, the, the, the tribes um, um, obviously are critical stakeholders and partners in, in what we do. Um, one of the beauties of working in Alaska, many of the parks there, um, subsistence, the ability for people in uh, uh, rural areas to continue to harvest uh, renewable consumptive uh, resources from the parks for their sustenance was a big part of management up there. And um, of course, while we don't have that same sort of uh, uh, rule set down here, the way in which we go about uh, uh, our jobs, the way we go about protecting and conserving and preserving the park and the access to the park uh, we will be, and I will be looking to, matter of fact, I was working on a, on a, on a letter just last evening uh, to the six tribes. Um, we'll be looking to them and their wisdom. They've been involved uh, in uh, land management, if you will, much longer than the National Park Service has, as we look to them for their traditional uh, knowledge and um, as we go about planning for how we manage the park in the in the in the future, I know they've done a, a good job of that here, and we're going to continue and and uh, elevate that as well as we go forward. I'm I, every time I see it or hear about it, I am stunned by the fact that the new Department of Interior Director Deborah Holland, 35th generation Native American, out of New Mexico, and I I just that that's so neat that she knows that and can trace that back. It's really and, powerful. And potentially a director for the National Park Service that has that That's right. same heritage. That's right. Greg, we wanna thank you. Um, I'm so looking forward to continuing our partnership and friendship with you. And uh, I just wanna highlight what's on the screen here. We are having our best year ever. A lot of people will say, well, it must be tough. It's like, no. And I think it's because people care so deeply and they are spending time in the national parks and they're realizing how important they are. And uh, so this year we're ending our fiscal year this month quite literally at $2.3 million. And um, it's, it's exciting. And that's just the start. Great things lie ahead for us with you with Olympic and North Cascades. So everyone to learn more, go to our website, this, this uh, webinar, or whatever, Zoom. This is recorded and uh, it will be posted on our site tomorrow. Reach out to us if you have any questions. We're here to answer anything that might come to mind. Greg, thank you and welcome to Mount Rainier. Again, we're just thrilled to have you. Thank you so much, Lori, and to all of those of uh, you who are with us, uh, come see us at Mount Rainier. Thanks everyone. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.